Hey there, product launchers. I have an interesting episode for you. This one's a little different. It's from our expert, De Dennis Shaver, and Dennis is Products on Demand, and he has a engineering viewpoint, but he decided to do a pre-recorded video for you of his engineer where he could ask him questions, and I think this is really critically important because both of them have an inventor mindset, so they get you, they get where they're coming from, where you want to bring a lot of inventiveness and originality and uh, innovation to the table. But how do you get that from your idea all the way through that engineering and not have it cost too much and not have it be unmanufacturable? So they're bringing you that viewpoint today in this great video. Hi there. My name is Dennis Shaver and welcome to this summit, Invent, Promote, Profit, where you'll learn from leading experts how they got their ideas from their mind to a design and eventually into a prototype so that they could get it out into the marketplace to reach its full potential. And that, of course, is profitability. With us today, I have a guest that I've known for quite some time. In fact, he's done a lot of work for my company in designing products for our aspiring inventors. My name is David Recker. I've been involved in product development for good 40 years. Uh, from 40? Our... Wait a minute, I thought you were 28. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> right, 10 years. Some of my best solutions have been come from just stepping back and saying, okay, how else could I do this? Mm -hmm. And boom, all of a sudden it comes to you and that's where I live. That's hmm. what I love to do. So that's, hmm. that's, that's what I live for, is okay. that inspiration, that little thing that just says, aha. Sure. Yeah. Every project it's different. So it is really understanding what is it you're trying to achieve, mm -hmm. okay? And the most important question is, is who are you serving? Mm -hmm. And your any product idea is serving somebody. So what is, who are you serving? Mm -hmm. And it's how do, you, how do you go about saying, okay, with my idea, how am I doing that? Mm -hmm. So and it may be you have to go out and look for experts in that field or even talking to people that are in that field or um, you know finding vendors that are, have a particular expertise mm -hmm. uh, so it really there's no simple answer to that it's when you you want to always align yourself with people who are going to listen to what you're saying mm -hmm. to really add to what you're doing because right. uh, there isn't anything any idea that is can go from idea to product in just one step. So it's like, how do you keep iterating and making it better? How can you draw in people, the right mm -hmm. people, that are willing to add to that, that mm -hmm. product? Um, seems a little obscure, but um, it, it's there's no magic formula. Sure. So it's a matter matter of finding those people, those vendors, those mm -hmm. resources that seem to really understand what you're doing and are willing to be a helpful hand. David, you come to us with many years of experience in engineering and there's different titles of engineering, so can you sort of elaborate on what your passion and your desire and your focus is on helping aspiring entrepreneurs with the type of engineering support that you're able to offer? Yes, it's, it's really a design process mm -hmm. and it's starting with um, brainstorming. For example, somebody comes to me and says, I've got this idea. Mm -hmm. And one of the first steps is to sit down and say, okay, how can we, how can we implement this idea? Mm -hmm. How do you see this being done? And you come up with thousands of ideas. Mm -hmm. And then no idea is a bad idea. But it, it's important to do is kind of write those down and say, okay, we could do this. What if that? You know, uh, What if it was this color? What if it was that? What if it did this? Mm -hmm. you know? So that brainstorming becomes a really important process. So the next phase would be conceptual, conceptual development, and that would be taking those brainstorming ideas and mm -hmm. try, trying to follow, you know, funnel those down into a number of concepts that that says, okay, what if I did this? What if I mm -hmm. did that? This 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 incorporates this number of features. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is too many fe features. Maybe I can defeature that and make it a little bit more simple. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so you kind of have a breadth 
from you know sort of what you'd expect to see to something that's a little bit more avant-garde. Mm -hmm. And there's something always in the in the middle. So in that conceptual design phase, what I always find uh, inspiring is that you're looking for something you didn't expect. So it's like pushing that idea one step further, sure, a couple more steps further. And that conceptual design uh, phase allows you to narrow down what you're going to do and mm -hmm. that and you can take that that's where you sort of the, is the stepping off point of how you start uh, an engineering phase they need to better understand what you mean by the conceptual stage and I would like to share with them how we can help them prepare uh, prepare meaning uh, like what do they need to do to come to a professional like you in engineering and be as prepared as possible so that they can get their point across to you so you know how to help them get that idea from their mind to an official design. Well, you know, this, um, if you look at the road map uh, that you've outlined, it's really important to do research. Mm -hmm. So number one, you have to have a good idea what your your concept is. What is what is your product idea? Right. So what are you trying to do? Who are you trying to serve? Mm -hmm. uh, second, you've got to do the research uh, that who else is doing having products out in the same area mm -hmm. uh, and that that can be done so many different ways uh, and it needs to be thorough mm -hmm. uh, Google eBay um, you know, <clears throat> United States Patent Office um, you know a number of different things to understand uh, what your product is, who else is in that marketplace. Mm -hmm. So that very intense research is really critical to have before you can start the engineering phase. Mm -hmm. So you have a really good idea where this is placed in the marketplace and what right. you're trying to accomplish. So research first is key. And they, research can, first. they can find that out pretty much what I call a sweat equity, where you just, yes. you can get online yes. and, and just, uh, yes. and what, what would be an example? Let's say for example, David, we have this coffee cup here and this person wants to create a new type of a, of a design of this lid, pretty much like this lid, but it's at least 10 to 15% different. So what would they do in a scenario like this where they, there's lids already out in the marketplace, but uh, and there's also markets for these lids. So what would they do to come prepared well, to you? The, 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 the thing would be to do is to document all the different types of lids that are out there. Sure. You know, and who, who's manufacturing those lids and what are all the different designs. Mm -hmm. And if I were them, I'd be buying each every one of those lids and saying, okay, what's good about this one? What's bad about that? Mm -hmm. You know, and really and document that and really know and be very clear, why do I need another coffee lid? Mm -hmm. because obviously it, there's a number of them out there and a very successful lid design could be the next big thing. Sure. So, but again, it's really knowing who else is out in the marketplace mm -hmm. um, and is this a marketplace that has room for you to come out with a new lid? Sure. So in essence, a situation like this, you not only could do what you said with get the lids that are already out there in the marketplace, uh, you mentioned earlier about research. They could actually research about what people are uh, giving for feedback about the current Correct. lids in the marketplace. Correct. And that feedback might be positive, and that feedback might be constructive or negative, and all of that is very valuable. It is. It and, is. And especially with an engineer that, to, to share that with you. Yes. And so what you want to do is you take, if I'm starting a project and I know all that, it gives me a, a place to start mm -hmm. from and not reinvent something that's already out there. Right. So it's, a, it, it, it's really a... Uh, potentially a cost savings in the long run having mm -hmm. doing all that research. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so then we're, we've done our research as an aspiring uh, inventor, uh, we bring that to you and that could be in the form of uh, crude prototypes to, uh, to uh, uh, photos of something that looks sort of like it, uh, to um, what's already on the market, right. and, um, and then bring that to you all as well as having uh, a structure, objectives of what I'm striving for, the benefits of it, uh, everything I can find out about it, but be able to get it all on one page perhaps. Correct. Correct. Right? But it's very important <clears throat> to have that competitive marketplace uh, research. Mm -hmm. It's very important to, to really define what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So what, what, is, what is different about your idea? Right. Uh, and it doesn't mean that that is going to be set in stone because part of this process is um, going out and developing how can you how can you stretch this idea and be open to new ideas around this particular product idea? Can you give us an example of what like with this lid uh, this this lid here that we're talking about? 
Well, um, say for instance, um, do I want to make that a disposable lid? Mm -hmm. Or do I want to make that something that's reusable? Mm -hmm. uh, how am I impacting the, the environment by making those choices? Mm -hmm. Do I want to make it spill proof? Or do I want to make it um, less expensive? Do I want to, what, what exactly is my goal? Sure. So it's really defining that. And you know, you can come up with a lot of different things just with that particular lid. You know, right. do you want it to be something that's more ergonomic? Is it something um, that is um, more environmentally friendly? Mm -hmm. uh, there's all kinds of different ways to approach that. Sure. And uh, when they come to see you, David, uh, do they? it's probably appropriate that they would bring a non-disclosure agreement uh, or unless they have uh, applied for, say, a provisional patent application, um, they would probably want to have an NDA, even though we, we keep everything confidential, but uh, to be prepared, you might want to have an NDA in place Correct. at this point. Well, as a professional, I would keep that trust yes. with the client no matter what. Of course. But it's important for uh, an inventor to have an NDA so he can he can keep the the process of intellectual property in 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 the right order, mm -hmm. so that he's not disclosing publicly what the idea is. Right. So the the purpose of the NDA is to say, okay, you can't disclose anything about my idea, so that when I go through my intellectual property process of mm -hmm. doing a patent, that hasn't been disclosed publicly, and somebody else mm -hmm. is doing the same thing. Sure. So sure. It, it helps protect you. It's sure. an important thing protection sure it's, there's it's an easy way to do it and anybody who um, is not willing to sign an NDA don't disclose mm -hmm. it's that simple it's that simple yes so we've done our aspiring inventor has done the research they have all this information they're at this uh, phase where uh, you're talking about the conceptual side of it so so what is it that you do at this point as an engineer to help that aspiring inventor at this stage, what is it you would deliver to them if they came when they come to you with an idea uh, in the cassette conceptual stage? Well, and I like to involve my clients in this process mm -hmm. uh, that conceptual design phase. And that I what I do is I'll, I'll go out and do a number of different sketches, uh, other uh, product examples, mm -hmm. uh, you know. But mostly, it's just a free form of saying, "What if you do this? What if you do that?" Uh, nothing, nothing cast in concrete, but it's just saying, okay, what if we did this with this idea? What mm -hmm. if we just push that a little bit more? Mm -hmm. And instead of looking at it in just one way, <clears throat> you're looking at it at ten different ways, right? Ten right. different <clears throat> perspectives. So at that point, you're probably trying to get into their head and find out exactly where their their <clears throat> their what their idea is to get the most to get as close as possible to what the finished product would look like. In a conceptual design. Well, in the conceptual design phase, you're not really worried about how the final product is. Right. You know, you you want to you want to think about it in a number of different ways. It's like um, if it's something that's held in the hand, mm -hmm. how important are the ergonomics to this yeah. product? You right. know, and is is in in most cases you want to be very cognizant of how this is being used. Mm -hmm. Mo one from a performance standpoint, and two from a safety standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and so, th in this phase, you're, you're not really worried about all those really finite details. It's just making sure you've covered all the bases and thinking about this different idea. Sure. So it's just it's a way to expand the idea. Mm -hmm. it's take it, you know, one, two, three, four more steps beyond what you thought it might be. Sure. What I like about the concept as the conceptual stage here is that when you get your idea and you want to be able to go to a designer and have them uh, at least create some renderings or concepts, as I noticed with you, David, is that, let's say, for example, I want to get this, uh, this coffee uh, lid here. I want to have a new style of a coffee lid. And so what you provide me is that you provide me several different concepts that are different perspectives, Correct. so to speak. Of, of this idea and then I as the inventor can look at it and say ooh I like option A a lot but David could we add uh, the, the, the under the feature on the on the one side of it here on option on C on option C put that under option A and combine that and that's that's what that's so great about that conceptual design phase is you're taking you can take those different features from different concepts mm -hmm. and combine them into a more cohesive design right so, right. so the, the next step is to take all those different ideas and put them into 
and you don't really need to have it down to just one particular idea at that point. It's just right. you want to go to sort of the next the phase where you're actually refining the design. Okay? Sure. And part of that is saying, okay, what are the, at that point you're looking at the number, how am I going to manufacture this? Is sure. this, a, is this a, an injection molded part? Is this, in the case of the, the, the lid here, yeah. you know, it's a vacuum form process. Um, is it a sheet metal? Is it a machining? Is it a, um, a uh, injection molded uh, metal? You know, right. there's so many different ways. So you want to kind of think about, okay, is this a high production thing, a high volume thing? Do mm -hmm. I want to sell millions of these? Right. Or do I want to sell 500 of these? Mm -hmm. Very, very different approach. Oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really important to kind of know, you know, where this product is. So you, you want to have in the next phase sort of this idea of, okay, this is a, a product that I want to do 10,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, I'm going to approach it very differently than if I'm doing 10 of these a year. Right. And I'm right. going to approach it differently if I'm going to do 100 million of these a year. Sure. It's a very, it's, there's, those kind of considerations are very important about how you, the choices you make in mm -hmm. the details of that product. Okay, so then you're at uh, you're at the conceptual stage, and we've figured out that out of option A, B, and C, uh, we like A the best, and so now that's the With concept. With features of B and C. Yes, yes, <laughs> right, right. And then they might change their mind after a while as well, yeah. because they're like, oh, what, 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 what about this? What about that? So, so we're at the conceptual stage now, and mm -hmm. you just delivered me the the concept, the overall concept of it, much like a a new race car. You know, you don't they don't make the race car officially the way it should look like they do. An official uh, some concepts of it. It's just a concept. Mm -hmm. So now we take that concept as an aspiring inventor, and they want to go to that next stage, and that is to get to an official design. Because I need to be able to get, I need to be able to find out the cost to manufacture it, or to make a prototype, so I can take the prototype out into the marketplace. So what's that next step once they've chosen that conceptual design that fits what they're looking for? What what do you do next? Well, it's really a design refinement. Okay. Uh, and that's where you start to. Um, utilize um, CAD tools to start actually building the product. CAD, just so you know what the CAD means? Oh yeah, computer aided <laughs> design. Yes. Uh, and it's, it's, just a, it's, a, it's just a tool. Mm -hmm. And it's a way to visualize the part with all the features that it needs mm -hmm. to be able to be manufactured. Sure. And uh, it's, a, it's a terrific tool. Uh, and in today's world, um, what happens is that CAD file could go directly to like a 3D printed part or a machine part, mm -hmm. or it can be used to uh, cut a injection molded tool. That right. same file, so it's a it's a really important tool, but it it's not just because you have this model, this part modeled mm -hmm. in, in CAD doesn't mean it's manufacturable. Sure, and, and if I could add one thing there, sure. so so um, many people will come to myself and I know you as well and say. I've got a patent and I'm all ready for you to identify the manufacturing costs for me. So they, sh they show you the patent and, and, and a lot of people don't, are not aware yes. of this. So, so they come to you with this, this patent and say, uh, okay, I need to know what it's going to cost to make uh, 5,000 parts a month, um, 5,000 parts a month to manufacture it. So um, can you uh, share the void, what's missing here uh, with the, uh, what we're calling illustration? Is it's not a design; it's an illustration. It's, it's just yes, yeah, just a conceptual mm -hmm. c conceptualization of the idea. Right. So, in order to manufacture, you need to identify every single part in that product. Yes. And the only way that you can get um, manufacturing costs are to literally have those parts designed for manufacturing. Me me the mechanical design, right? Correct. Yes. But that uh, not everything's mechanical. There might be a uh, circuit board involved. There might be some yeah. software involved. There but might be. But to sort of the for to sort of be able to visualize this thing, yes. um, it, it's really a mechanical design. Sure. And and, and it and it may be, and it depends on what the product is. It's there's such a wide variety. Right. Um, and it's important to have somebody who is. In tune with all the different types of manufacturing processes, oh yeah, and to work with somebody who's got experience in that area, mm -hmm. uh, because it, it can have a great impact. Uh, right. Choice of process, choice of materials. Uh, mm -hmm. There's, there's. I always want to 
be conscious of how is this impacting the environment. Mm -hmm. I like to use things that are biodegradable. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to use things that can be recycled. It's mm -hmm. not always the case, but you know, when you can, it's, it's really important to have that, that stance. Yes. Um, so to kind of clarify this a little bit more, it's like, like taking this, this lid and mm -hmm. I'm going to actually model this lid exactly like this in, mm -hmm. in my CAD system. And then with this data, mm -hmm. uh, it's basically a parametric data that says, this is, this is all the geometry of this mm -hmm. cup. And with that, that data, I can now go and get a, like say, uh, a uh, 3D printed part to just kind of look at the concept. Right, right. Uh, so, so, so with that said, uh, you you would not only, an example as an inventor, you would not only bring the lid examples, you would also bring the mating part, the cup, that it correct. goes to as well. Yeah. Right, okay. And you know, this, and this is a good example because yeah. this impacts that. It sure does. And so, you know, does this need to be designed. <laughs> That's right. You know, is this is this a, uh, is this the product or is this the product? Right. You know. So it's really it really is. A lot of people think this is the product. Right. Well, the the experience for the user is this. Yes. So you have to you have to take all of this under consideration. Right. Yeah. So so uh, it, when you're looking for an engineer. Um, there are many engineers out there, there's many different types of engineers out there, there's many different engineers with many different backgrounds out there. So to David's point here, uh, if I could expand on it, is that what you want to look for in an engineer is somebody who, a professional who has ex expertise in not only designing really cool designs, uh, for example the concepts, because mm -hmm. we have industrial engineers, I believe that's what you call industrial them. Industrial designers. And, and industrial designers who, who do the really beautiful look of a concept but it may not be manufacturable. So it's important to make sure that once the concept is put together that you go to a mechanical designer, if that's making a, a coffee lid, for example, coffee cup lid, is that you make sure that that person that you interview for doing the work for you has design for manufacturability experience. We call it DFM, design for manufacturability. So I just want to make sure you make that clear. Correct, mm -hmm. correct. Do you want to expand on that? Well, it, <laughs> and, that, and that's a tough one because it is. Um, you know there are a lot of uh, there's a, there's a lot of resources out there um, that can design a product but don't aren't aware of the manufacturing process. Right. And one of the things that in the product development that's so important is that understanding that you're touching a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. So with this product, you have to be able to say, okay. The, the ultimate judge of all this is the end user, the person mm -hmm. who's going to buy this. Mm -hmm. And you can do all the right things, and if they don't, they don't accept it, mm -hmm. you're nowhere. So it's right. part of this mm -hmm. process is to prototype as often as you can, mm -hmm. uh, and get it, get some feedback from your the end customer, mm -hmm. so that you know that this is something that they're going to go for. Yes, you know it's so important. It's not just coming out with just. A single design mm -hmm. uh, there might be some iterations to that that's going to be more acceptable to the end user than what you expect mm -hmm. so never never assume that you know what that end user is going, is going to accept or not accept oh, that's so true <laughs> yeah so it, it's really so in this process because um, we it's it's really to make it really simple it's really the conceptual development mm -hmm. sort of the design requirement where you can actually make parts mm -hmm. and get that feedback mm -hmm. and then the next step is to make that is that design for manufacturing sure you know and and my take on it is keep it simple always go for the simplest solution because yes. yep. the more complex you get the more things can go wrong mm -hmm. um, and so it's it's finding somebody who knows those little nuances mm -hmm. and every and it's really it's every product has these little nuances, you know, right? And, it, and it, it's understanding what those nuances. It's like, how do you get all the right ingredients mm -hmm. to make this this thing sing? Right. Uh, and it's and it's it's really important to uh, before you make huge commitments to the final design is mm -hmm. to do some prototyping of various different iterations of this to get the kind of feed, to get feedback to know that you're really going 
in the right direction. That's a really good point. In fact, uh, going back to the coffee lid here, where all we're doing is we're designing this lid uh, in this scenario. So we could actually take the mechanical design that you provide me as an inventor and take that and get it 3D printed, perhaps, Correct. so that you can check a form, fit, and functionality verification. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I want to test it with end users to say, gosh, when I use this, is it going to drip all over me? Right. You know, what's 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 the comfort of this as I'm mm -hmm. drinking out of it? Mm -hmm. You know, and is this if it's comfortable to me, is it com comfortable to you? Mm -hmm. You know, it's those little subtle things that are so important to understand about your product. Right. So it's not just this. The answer just isn't in the engineering product. The answer is in, you know, developing this, knowing that there are a lot of nuances, and that's in every product. There isn't a product out there that I've right. been involved in that there isn't some little nuance mm -hmm. that that is makes or breaks the product. Right. So, so an example of the nuance could be we're back to this coffee lid here, and we went out and we made the first prototype based on the design files you provided me. And by the way, right. when you get your design files from your mechanical designer. Chances are you'll get, like David mentioned, 3D CAD files, computer-aided design files, and they can come in different uh, outputs, like uh, exported into, um, what's an example, IGES files, IGES, and... Well, there's there are a number of different CAD products out there, and they mm -hmm. all have a different kind of format, right? but they all have standard formats, and it's really the, the, the important thing is the source file, mm -hmm. and it's what's important is that the inventor wants to own those source files mm -hmm. and know that he owns those. So right. in part of the agreement that he needs to make with any uh, person he gets, any resource, is that he owns those files. Yes. You know, and there's, there's situations where that doesn't happen. Right. And you can, somebody can go in, uh, where this happens is where somebody thinks they're working with a, a vendor that's going to manufacture and they're doing the design work. Mm -hmm. And they may find out this isn't the right vendor, the, the relationship doesn't proceed like you hoped they would, mm -hmm. and find out at the end uh, that they don't own any of those files. That's scary. Yeah, and yeah. it happens. Right. It right. happens often. Right. So when the mechanical design files are ready, then you as an inventor can take those files anywhere that uh, to a manufacturer or a prototype house, a prototype firm that 3D prints parts, and take those engineering files, and they'll have your name on it as well. You should have your name on the bottom of it, and uh, what is personal and confidential, or whatever the confidentiality language is, and take those engineering files. You can either email them to a manufacturing facility, or put them on some type of a thumb drive or something, so you can take it to that vendor and have them look at those files and they'll be able to know, based on those files, what they can do to provide you a quote to fabricate the parts from there, right? Yeah, and, and there's there's so many great techniques for prototyping mm -hmm. these days and a lot of them you can download the files directly online and get a yeah. quote immediately on on that, whether it be right. you know machining or a 3D printed part or mm -hmm. uh, even sheet metal mm -hmm. uh, and, or CNC machining. I mean. We live in an age where doing prototypes um, is so much easier than it used to be. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, and, and effective because you, yes. you you can actually really test directly using those parts. Right. Um, so it, it, you know, we're talking about a, a relatively sophisticated way to prototype, mm -hmm. and there isn't anything wrong with doing cardboard pro prototypes as you're mm -hmm. you're putting this together. Mm -hmm. You know taking and modeling it in clay, right. taking it and cutting up cardboard, mm -hmm. um, you know, taking some plastic and cutting it up and gluing it together. Or I mean, styrofoam or yeah, a number of so, materials. Yeah, so, you know, depending on what the, the product is, you know, make it 3D as yes. quick as you can. Yes. And, and I think the most important thing in this process is don't be uh, concerned about failure. Don't be concerned about failure. Yeah, because yes. every time you fail, you learn something. So it's a yeah. matter; it's an iterative process. You build on it, right? And it it is it is. You can't expect this process to go in a straight line. It's not linear. It is like, oh my God, I didn't think that. I didn't think of that. Right. Oh, well, now we have this problem. Now we have that problem. You solve this, right. you create another. But it's always knowing that you've got you've got a lot of things to. Um, bring together mm -hmm. to make it all work right and it sounds uh, intimidating mm -hmm. but it is part of the process and you can have fun with that absolutely you know it's and a that's, fun journey yeah. for sure. and it's understanding that you're going to be going through that process mm -hmm. that that you are you are going to fail mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. and don't worry about that. Mm -hmm. It's like be prepared for that. And okay, what do you what if, what can you learn from that? Mm -hmm. You know, because that gives you ammunition for the next thing. You know, that's Thomas Edison. You know, he said it best. It's one percent. Inspiration, 99% perspiration. Oh, yeah. We're always going like this out there going, yeah. oh, my gosh, what are we yeah. going to do next? But it, it's so true, that process. <laughs> yes. And, and back to this, the, the, the coffee lid, the design of the coffee lid. Let's say that the design is done with a mechanical designer. You go to a 3D printer, and you actually get that part printed, and it's fabricated. And then you come back to uh, David, the designer, and say, okay, um, this works great, but, uh, you know, it, it, that, that little feature that goes up and down, uh, it doesn't seem to be big enough. Well, who would know that until you try it out on a real part? So it could be a really good design, yet when you fabricate the part, it may not feel just right. Maybe the ergonomics isn't right. Maybe it's not functioning the way you want it to function. So there's some iterations, as you Correct. mentioned earlier. Correct. And so many new inventors are like, okay, the design's done, I'm ready to rock and roll, I'm ready to get some parts manufactured, fill my garage full of product, and sell like crazy. It's not that way. It's important to make sure you dial this in as close as possible and do the uh, fail forward, so to speak, right? That's a good, good term for doing it. Yeah, yeah, rather than getting all down and out because it's not working. It's like find a way to evolve it. We had a client at one point where we did a design for, and uh, you really don't know how that product is, that, that first part that's fabricated is going to function, and you can have a beautiful design, but when you actually make the product, you're going to find some flaws. You're going to find some changes that need to be done. And, and so many people think, I got the product, I'm ready to go to the market. It's like, no, no, no. Take the time to do it right. Get as close as possible to you can to working out those bugs because the more time you invest in getting it as close as possible, being as perfect as possible, but it's not perfect, but it's constantly perfecting on that journey. Another thing to add to this is that as you're designing this product, you need to really think about how all the people that touch this product yes. along the line. Mm -hmm. So um, when you are, you've got, you've got some parts, but mm -hmm. you have somebody who's going to assemble those parts. How's right. that going to happen? Right. How, do, how, do they, how does this all come together? And ease of assembly is just as important as, uh, and it's part of the designed for manufacturing that you have mm -hmm. something that you can assemble quickly, easily, with the fewest amount of parts. But that also has to be shipped someplace else to be um, put in packaging. Packaging, or yes. It's put in the package at, at mm -hmm. the manufacturer, mm -hmm. but somebody's touching that to put it in the box. How right. does how's that experience, mm -hmm. you know? So then somebody somebody has to put that on the shelf. Right. You know, or, you know, if you're distributing online, how's that? How's that package? package yep. uh, how's that look online? Uh, so many, but everybody. There's so many people who touch this. Even mm -hmm. the shipping person has to be able to put this in a box. That box may go onto a pallet. That pallet may go onto a truck or a mm -hmm. ship or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you have to think about all those different things uh, in order for this to be work itself through and be successful. Because those, each one of those steps can cause issues with the fundamental design. Right. So it's right. really thinking through all those different steps and understanding that, yes, you may have done all this thing correct, but the packaging is wrong. Or right. the packaging is is one centimeter too big, and now mm -hmm. I can't put it in to a shipping box that can go onto a pallet that's efficient. Mm -hmm. I lose, you know, maybe three boxes or four boxes on a pallet because I didn't design the package right. Oh, that's so true. In fact, so, uh, that's a very good point. In yeah. fact, uh, when you're getting, we also have another talk uh, interview on uh, the power of the pitch, the elevator pitch on your idea. And it's so important to have these things figured out ahead of time, uh, especially with your designer to know, uh, number one, how you're going to design for manufacturability. Two, uh, you can take your design files and find out all the costs that are associated with getting that prototype made, getting the production made, getting the packaging made, um, uh, getting it shipped, uh, bulk packaging, everything pretty much you can find out um, by having that design of perhaps the prototype. So that when you go to do your pitch, you can just basically share a couple of words. We've already done the, the DFM files, the design for manufacturability files. Uh, we've got the packaging figured out from those files and it just helps uh, position you at a certain uh, level that when you're doing your pitch, with your potential target market,
they know you've done your homework. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and most, most, whether you're going to, for a licensing type agreement, or you're going to mm -hmm. um, a, some kind of um, financial resource, yes, and there's yeah. so many of those that that's a whole nother discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to have that what's called the cost of goods, mm -hmm. and part of that cost of goods is, you know, all your different parts, mm -hmm. your manufacture, your um, assembly, yes, uh, your um, packaging, right. your shipping box, mm -hmm. you know, um, and one thing that a lot of people forget about is tooling costs. Tooling, yes. Yeah, because if you if you yeah the coffee cup lid coffee cups. Yes. This is a good example. Been very helpful. Yeah. Bring it up a little higher. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. The coffee lid. Right. Now this this particular one is it's called a vacuum form process, but it requires a tool. Right. And that costs money. Mm -hmm. You know. And what they what they'll do is they'll have mm -hmm. a a tool that has multiple pieces on this thing, mm -hmm. and you can then influence the cost on how you for every time. The press comes down and makes one of these things. If you do one, it's very expensive. And it's just, yeah, there's yeah. only a few parts you can do per hour, so to speak, the output. Correct. Yeah. So if you're doing injection molding, that's another thing, is if you just do one at a time, it's mm -hmm. much more expensive than doing a multi cavity tool and doing, you know, four, eight, 12, 64, or whatever yeah, it is. Whatever right? it is. Yeah. Uh, and all that has a cost associated with it. Yes. You know, so it's not just. And there's, there's strategies for, you know, how do I start in the market with the least amount of capital, mm -hmm. which is always really important to make oh, sure yeah. it goes, but what are my next steps, you right. know, to follow very quickly. Okay, this is a success, now I have to deliver. Okay, I've delivered 50 of these, now they want me to deliver 5,000. Or, or, or 100,000, now, so now you're at a point where you've done the mm -hmm. one cavity mold to keep your costs down, mm -hmm. to go out and test market, and all of a sudden you're getting all these letters of intent, like, I really like your product, David. Uh, how, how and when can I get 10,000 a month? Correct. So to speak. So now. Well, the question, the question is, is this, can you deliver this by then? Right. So, I want it next week. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, part of this in saying this is that it's how do you, how do you anticipate the steps involved? You know, right. one is initial release. Mm -hmm. How do I keep my costs down there? Mm -hmm. But how do, what, what's my next step? to really go in and gear this up and ramp this up for higher production. Right, and you can find out all these answers yes. by using the engineering files. So, so right, I mean, you just take the engineering files, you can find out what the prototype costs are, you can find out what manufacturing costs are, low volume, medium volume, extremely high volume, the turnaround time, if you're gonna do it overseas or locally, uh, that's what I think is the magic of, and the art of engineering when it comes to the mechanical design files, is everything's there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. That's the starting point. Yes, indeed. And to get to that starting point, you really need to have um, a group or an individual, um, an engineering resource that mm -hmm. you really have confidence in. Yes. And understands all these different nuances because right. it it you know, if you deal with somebody that says, okay, I can produce you an engineering file, and just gives that to you, it's not very helpful. Especially, especially when you take that engineering file and they've delivered and they wash their hands like, okay, I've done my job for you. And you take those engineering files to a manufacturing company, all of a sudden the manufacturing company says, uh, I have some questions about this design. There's a couple of features we can't achieve with injection molding, but it's an injection molded part, right? Yeah, and that, that brings up a very important uh, point. Um, when I'm developing a product, I'm always using, I'm always reviewing this with my vendors mm -hmm. before I turn over the final file. That's helpful. And, and that is so important because mm -hmm. <clears throat> they said, you know, if you just do this, mm -hmm. we can reduce the cycle time, mm -hmm. which is reduces the cost. Right. If you just do that, you know, because I, there is, they are so much experts on how they do something. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I'm an expert, mm -hmm. but there's that, that working together that really makes it really uh, work well. Yes, so very it's, important. It's very important that the, the engineering resource actually is involved with the manufacturer mm -hmm. so that you can make those little tweaks uh, and it may be very subtle. Maybe sure. it just 
Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, you, bring up, you bring up a really good point here: is that when you're meeting with, uh, interviewing your potential mechanical engineers, is to find out uh, what resources do they have to. Uh, get this design so that it's manufacturable. So in David's scenario, you'd probably say, well, uh, I've worked in this business for many years, several decades, I'm not trying to say what age you are, <laughs> but, but I've worked in this industry for many, many decades yes. and I've learned a lot and, and what's important is that you have the engineers working with the manufacturers because this Correct. is that collaboration is what makes a product, uh, 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 the, the design successful, is exactly. to collaborate. And you find this out while you're designing. You yeah. might come up with a part in that, that coffee cup lid that's like, oh man, I don't know if we can achieve this with a, a, a large 64 cavity mold. We might need to change some features on it, right? Exactly, exactly. Good. So uh, I could ask you questions all day on behalf of our listeners, and I know that there will be other times to talk. So mm -hmm. um, I do have one question on behalf of our listeners. And that is, what is it that you would like to leave our listeners with about the importance of incorporating the most effective design into their invention so that they're doing they're, 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 they're on the right path to achieve their true potential with their idea I, I think the thing that's most important is to be open to feedback mm -hmm. because without that um, the, you have you'll have limited success mm -hmm. Uh, you might get lucky and hit the home run, but I think it's so important to be very open to modifying that idea mm -hmm. so it does become successful. Mm -hmm. And that can come from so many different sources. It's not just engineering. Mm -hmm. It's from marketing, marketing people. It's from, the most important feedback is from the end user. Oh, yes. You know, <laughs> uh, it, you have to be open and flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, and in my career, I have experienced a number of inventors who have not been flexible and it, none of those people that I know have gone anywhere they've not gone anywhere with that yeah. Yeah. so it's really important to be flexible open and that the idea is just the first step mm -hmm. and to be successful so many things have to come together mm -hmm. engineering is so important the research is so important the intellectual property is so important the marketing is all important and it's not just one of these things being successful. All mm -hmm. of these things have to be successful. Right. And so if, if you can go into this with an open mind and an open heart mm -hmm. and look and be open to modifying this idea, because every time you are open, you're going to get one step better. Absolutely. And it, I think that's the important thing. Absolutely. Appreciate that, share. In fact, um, when you take that prototype, so you just get to the prototype stage, uh, I think up until that, that stage, you're all about just knowing, knowing what the, you think the needs are based on your research. If you've not went out to your target market, then you'll convert what you think are their needs, then you take the prototype out there to your target market and you actually find out what they want because mm -hmm. you're going to show that prototype to them and they're going to be so excited about it. It's like, wow, this is a fantastic idea, Dennis, but um, may I offer a couple suggestions? And of course, you would definitely say, yes, what can I do to help you with this? Well, there's where you get the buy-in with it with potential uh, customer. They suggest some, some changes and you listen because those are then that you're converting needs, what you think they need, to what they actually want. And then you take those changes, come back to an engineer like David and say, David, this is what the potential client said is they also want to have some blah, blah, blah type of things, features on this. And can you make changes to the design so that I can then go and make an, a reiter reiteration, a new prototype and take it back out to them. And that's how you get buy-in is the power. It's the power of the prototype. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, power of the prototype. And prototype often. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Keep prototyping for sure. So, so David, I understand you have a gift for our listeners today. Can you elaborate more on that, please? Uh, yes. What I'd like to offer is a PDF file that lists uh, important questions that you want to ask your engineering resource. Uh, so I think this would be a really good guide to help you interview and select somebody to help you out.
Wow, that's fantastic. In fact, uh, I know it's going to be very beneficial because I've, I've heard Dave's questions before of uh, aspiring inventors about where they want to go with their ideas. So to be able to have something on paper that you can look at first and then get acquainted with that so you can be more prepared to ask the most effective questions of a potential engineer, uh, the more effective your journey will be in getting your idea from mind to market. So. Thank you very much. And we'll actually have that on a link at the end of this video as well, so you can access to that as well. So uh, to all your listeners, thank you so much for attending, and uh, I appreciate your reaching out with your questions. Uh, there's so many questions that people are asking because they want to be able to get their idea uh, most cost-effectively from mind to market. So again, watch your inbox for the next interview, and thank you again for this time, and uh, have yourself a fantastic day, and we'll talk soon. Bye.